Hi, good morning. This is Tina Greenbaum, author, speaker, workshop leader, trainer, and the creator of the program Mastery Under Pressure. And I have an awesome guest with me today, and her name is Loretta Hayes. Hi, Loretta. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Oh, so, so nice to have you. And I'm going to read a little bit about Loretta, just a little bit about her very long biography, so we get to get a sense of her. And then we're gonna ask her some great questions. So here we go. So Loretta has over 35 years of experience in the financial and management arena, starting early on in her career while working both in private and public sectors of business. She demonstrated an innate talent to organize and bring simple systems and structures to the complex mechanisms of business. So I'm going to stop right here because I want you to tell us a little bit more personally. We get just a little sense that you're great with systems, you're great with business, you've been doing this for years and years. So give us a little background, Loretta, just kind of what you're doing now, and then I'm going to go back and ask you, so how did you get here? So there you go. Well, what I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm actually training entrepreneurs to make more money. Bottom line, it's about them making more money. Yes. And it's about having it be effortless. Most people think that they have to work harder and I want them to work smarter, not harder. Okay. And it's really about productivity, performance, and having a life that they love. So truly in working with the entrepreneurs, it's having them bring more workability in what they do and to bring more leadership and management. Mm -hmm. Goodness knows we need that, don't we? <laughs> because as entrepreneurs, most of us have become this way because we love what we do. We love our area of expertise, but our area of expertise is not necessarily business. So combining the two is really the ticket, isn't it, in terms of real success? It, it is. That, that, um, what the, there's a book called The E-Myth, and it talked about people that, became, that were really good at what they did, and they, started, they became a contractor, as an example, and then their business failed. They ended up in debt. They didn't have successful uh, organizational skills or leadership skills, and leadership in of itself in today's culture mm -hmm. tends to be more about domination, being more about a bully, being more aggressive, and that's not actually leadership. Funda fundamentally, leadership is about being authentic, mm -hmm. being a cause, mm -hmm. and actually having a higher purpose. So that really is the, the leadership now needs to take a change and actually come from empowering and not from dominating. Right. So this is a great interface between what you do and what I do, because I work on the inner game with people. And mm -hmm. so this is now now in, in mode, isn't it? You know, that to be a leader, you have to be authentic. In order to be authentic, you have to do personal work. You have to know yourself. You have to be able to be vulnerable. Correct? Yes. Yes, abs absolutely. And you have to know what's running the show. If you look at what um, leaders do now, they, they don't really know that they're, as an example, if they were a, a dominated by someone. I have a, a client that's really awesome, brilliant man, and he didn't speak for the first seven years of his life. And so he tends to not confront things. So in that sense, that he's now learned to actually be authentic, speak up, do what's work, and being able to express himself fully so that the workability in his company is, is soaring. He's doubled his volume in the last two years. Wow. So it's such an interesting piece. And we'll go back a little bit, you know, in terms of your history, but you're, you're touching on the things that are close to my heart, right? Because sometimes the changes need to happen externally, right? They need to happen in the environment and you need to move things around. You need to move people around. But many times it happens, has to happen internally first, right? And then you can make those external changes. So, so how do you address that with these with leaders that have, you know, have that dominating kind of authoritarian kind of demeanor? Well, I always look at what they want uh -huh. because life is a game and one thing has to be more important than something else. So if what's more important to them is being successful, 
being empowering, then they will give up the domination. They will actually listen and be coached about it. And what's really interesting is something that you said, and that is, is, is that for a coach, they actually have to walk their talk. They actually have to do that inward looking. They actually have to throw themselves on the sword. They have to really step out and swing out because they can't ask someone else to do that if they've never done it because they don't actually have any experience or any relationship to what it takes. That's right. I always say that you cannot take a person to a place that you haven't been. And that's exactly what you're saying. So you know, Exactly. Right? And the other thing that I, that I noticed too... Um, and, and I'd love to hear your kind of take on this. Most of the people that I know that are extraordinarily successful, and I mean in, not only in money, but in life in general, they've had their series of ups and downs. They've had their dark night of the soul. <laughs> they've had their, their um, bankruptcies. They've had, you know, so tell me a little bit more about your experience with dealing with people who life is not just this one <laughs> you know, kind of uh, forward thinking, just upward going. Tell us a little bit about maybe some interesting cases that you've had of people who've had, really had their ups and downs and have come out on top through your assistance. Well, I work with a phenomenal man who has been very committed to safety and aeronautics. And he started out, I mean, he would do anything in life to, to, to make a living. And he has some particular behavioral issues that interfere. And one of the things is, is that he, he started taking the coaching. He just would make a promise, say, okay, I'm going to do this. This is all I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. And then he would do the next thing. And so, and then he had statistics so that he could see ways how he was improving, um, uh, many clients have developed dashboards for them. So mm -hmm. if you're driving down the road or flying a, a, a jet, you can't have your dashboard taped up. It doesn't do very well if duct tape <laughs> is over the dashboard. So and if you don't have one, then you really are in trouble. So <laughs> dashboards have been proven to be really beneficial for people so they can see the speed they're going, if they've got oil pressure, if they've got, if it's too, the engine's too hot, those kinds of things that a dashboard would never, normally give you. Mine are more financial right. so, or physical in the sense of how many phone calls they have to make. Or um, I remember a trucking company that, that really wanted to excel. And what we broke down is if they did 22 loads a day, mm -hmm. they were profitable. So they managed everything in the company around making 22, 22 loads a day mm -hmm. from getting the calls, doing the dispatching, making sure they had the trucks. Everything they did in the company was organized something around something very simple. Right. Twenty-two loads a day. You know, you. The other thing I noticed, yeah, just to, to put a button on it, is is that when people get really successful, many times they can't stand it that good. Mm -hmm. So you really have to look at how good you can stand it because they will break the game down. Look at lottery winners who have millions of dollars and then are bankrupt. So that really have to be able to embrace the wealth, embrace the success. And actually for them, for them to do that, they actually have to transform who they know themselves to be exactly. into do, being successful. Exactly. And again, you have another way of saying what I say is that in order to become bigger, we have to become bigger. We have to be able to hold more energy. We have to be able to hold more complexity. We have to be able to hold more of life's ambiguities because things are not black and white, you know. So as you're talking and as I'm thinking as sort of a, a transpersonal uh, psychotherapist, this is, this is what has to happen is we have to kind of really transform who we are. And what I, what I like to say about transformation is it's really not into somebody else. It's really becoming who we are. It's, it's coming home to the self. So. Yes. It, it, it's sort of a paradoxical thing. As we become bigger, we become more uh, authentic in who we are. So, so let's go back a little bit, Loretta. You have, a, um, and, I'll, and I'll come back to where you are too, because you're bringing up so many things that are so pertinent, not only to me as an entrepreneur and, and my experience and my experience of working with so many other people. But how did you get here? Tell us a little bit about your background, how you got here. Well, as a, as a career, I mean, I was raised by a couple of parents that, that really thought that I should be competent and able. And so 
part of what happened in my life is I was joke about this as a girl. I learned to use power tools at 12. Yeah. At the age of 14, I ended up saving a man's life with my twin sister uh, on a sailboat at night because he fell overboard. Wow. And if we not, if we, my sister and I handled the boat. It was a 30 foot sailboat in the ocean and wow. we were able to bring the boat about and save the man's life. So there was a level of competency and not getting, you know, screaming like a girl in, in an emergency, <laughs> you know, and, and I do scream like a girl, but that said, and, and then my dad had me learn how to fly a small airplane at the age of 16. Wow. And it was more about, you know, if something happened in the plane, could I handle the plane? And so those kinds of things gave me a really strong level of uh, certainty, competency, um, willingness uh, to take things on. And in my own path, I uh, became, worked in accounting and domains and always moved up into a management position. In my early 30s, I was running an engineering company uh, that in today's dollars did about $60 million a year. Wow. I had five people directly underneath me. And... So that, that part of it, and I was, by the way, the first woman at a pre-job conference in the state of California. Wow. So, so that allowed me to continue to grow and understand business. And then inside of that, what occurred is I started my own um, accounting practice, bookkeeping practice, because mm -hmm. I'm not a CPA, mm -hmm. um, but a bookkeeping practice that um, was one of the high, most highly paid bookkeepers in Sonoma County. Mm -hmm. um, because I did it by contract. So I became very successful early on um, in my life. And then I was invited to be trained as a course leader and as a coach. And so that's how I ended up where I am now is, is that I helped build a multi-million dollar consulting practice um, and did uh, uh, had a great team that I worked with. Beautiful. So if we take the elements, okay, as I'm listening to you, I'm listening to the elements that have helped you with your success. And I think that this is really important for people to hear because as we all want to be successful, we have to go find the pieces that aren't working. You know, we've got pieces that work and then we've got obstacles and challenges that are frequently blind spots, right? Mm -hmm. That's why, yes. why we have coaches because as I say, the unconscious by its nature is unconscious and we frequently can't see the things that we can't see. So one of the things that you talked about is that at an early age, you were given an opportunity to, to grow, to, to show that you have competence, to give you the, not only the competence, but the confidence to be able to depend on yourself. What happens with people who don't have that kind of upbringing? What, what, what would you recommend to them? Well, something that you said about authenticity, it's actually self, capital S-E-L-F, mm -hmm. self-express. Mm -hmm. So when we look at who we are being, we can tap into trusting self. Again, that's a capital S-E-L-F. Mm -hmm. So we trust that self, that being, to be able to, to um, expand. And I love expansive conversations where people can see that there's an opportunity to grow, get bigger. And you have to be willing to fall down and skin your knees. You ha really, truly have to be willing to do that. Um, Helen, Helen Keller, quote: there's a quote that says, security is a superstition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was either a daring adventure or nothing. And truly, we have to be willing to do that. And otherwise, trying to hide out in our homes or be safe, you can't take the risk out of life. Life is risky. And, and so if you can embrace that and trust self, then you actually can start to take on new things. And that's really what the coaching is about for me, is having people open up and see that there's an opportunity and to trust self. Beautiful. So as you're, again, as you're talking, what we're, we're also saying is, and again, this is one of the things that I teach is, there's an edge of discomfort. And if we go way beyond that edge of discomfort, we're sort of into overwhelm and that, and that doesn't work, you know? And if we, don't, if we don't challenge it at all, we don't grow. So it's really learning how to tolerate that level of discomfort, right? And then there's a law that, of accommodation which says that as we ask of ourselves every day, every day, every day, a little bit more, a little bit more, we begin to accommodate to the new level. 
you know, and then we turn around and we say, oh my God, how did I get here? <laughs> I don't even know how I got here. And so, um, you know, it's just so interesting to hear the way that you have, you have operationalized, you know, these, these facets and these, these tenants to help people expand. So tell us again of another, another story of somebody who's really had real difficulty and again, has gone through and been willing to listen to you, to hear your coaching, that they've been able to get beyond anything that maybe they ever thought was possible. Who else comes to mind? Well, the, the, working with someone who, like I said, didn't actually speak for the first seven years of his life. Mm -hmm. And he came from a very interesting background. And that part of that is, is that his mother was at Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. So she had an, a beautiful, and a beautiful woman. She's still alive. She's a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. And her way of bringing her children up was to be concealed, mm -hmm. to hide. Yes. If you can, you know, you can actually, and I actually asked him one day when we were coaching about what that personality was about. And that's how I found out about his mother. And the thing is, is that he's, he's really willing to swing out. He's willing to play a big game and he has declared bankruptcy. He's lost things, but he's willing to persevere. There's a, there's a part of us that if we can tap into being a warrior. Yes. And it's really about being a warrior because I think that you really have to stand for something. And mm -hmm. in our culture, people don't stand for very much. Mm -hmm. It's, it truly, it's, I, and I really, when I'm coaching uh, groups, I always at, talk up to them about taking a stand and um, I'll give you a, a, a little brief story. So my sister and I had polio when we were young. Mm. My sister was completely handicapped and um, in her legs and wore braces and crutches. And we were in Los Angeles and at that time. And when we went to go to grade school, the LA County told my father, who was all of 24 years old, <laughs> that his daughter could not go to school because she might hurt someone with her crutches. So he has a photograph of him standing on the courthouse. We have sandwich boards on us. One, my sister's is saying, I can't go to school with my sister because I'm crippled. And mine said, I can't go to school. My sister can't go to school with me because she's crippled. Something wow. like that. Wow. Los Angeles County was the first county in this country to say that handicapped children had the right to a public education. It happened 12 months later. Wow. He, by himself, he took a stand that we had the right to be together and we had the right to be in a public school. That's a stand. When right. you stand for something, one of the things that I know about you is you stand for your clients. You stand for your, the, the people around you. And that takes something. Yes. And most people don't have any muscle in taking a stand. And I really, I evoke people and demand people to take a stand. You don't have to die on every hill. I'm not interested in that. But right. what I am interested in is standing for your you know, your brothers, your sisters, your family, your community, and for yourself. Absolutely. And you have to stand for yourself. Absolutely. And I think one of the other things, and again, you can speak to this, is as you become more visible and as you become more public, you also become more vulnerable. Correct? Yes. So yes. have there been any times in your life where – People have kind of come after you, you know, that, 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 you know, your good nature and your good standing and has come under fire. Has that, has that ever happened to you? Not my good nature, more my rigor. <laughs> okay. I'm much more, I'm much more deliberate about things and I don't step over stuff. Mm -hmm. Now there are things that I will step over, but I don't step over things. I actually, I will say, I will, I actually use a term, this doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I'm really committed to workability, but I'm not wor willing to be with what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I will stand for something and say something. More, more of what's happened in my life is, is that I've done several forensic cases uh -huh. <laughs> in businesses. And I, and I only do it by referral. It's not something that I go out and seek. But um, it, it, you know, I'm coaching a client. They said, this is happening in my business, whatever. And it, in... Um, both in one case, I was actually threatened yeah. because I got too close to the money yeah. and figure and figured it out. So the thing is, is, is that in that case, it takes a warrior. It takes somebody willing to stand for something 
And, you know, I'm not, I don't think people should be out there standing on a hill by themselves. Right. Because that's not really a good idea. But really, I had, I had people that backed me up and, and um, supported me in that process. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that one of the things that I do is in working with people and working with groups, I let them know who I am. Mm -hmm. And who I am is a stand for them. And who I am is their integrity. And who I am for them is their success. And in that, I practice a rigor. And, and sometimes with clients, if I'm coaching them in a group, or I will say to them, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let them know that they're not going to like it so that I can actually get their listening and have them see that they're not going to like it. But it's in, I, I'm only doing it for their best interest because exactly. I didn't care. I just say, fine, do whatever you want to do, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> so that's the risk that you take as a coach and as a consultant. Yes. But that, and, and coaches are very different than consultants, really. Coaches evoke. Coaches call people forth. Coaches mm -hmm. ask questions, whereas mm -hmm. consultants tell you what to do. And sometimes I have to have my consultant hat on and tell them about what they're doing in their accounting. Right. But mostly it's about having them what they want to have. So they have to, be, they have to step forward and swing out. They're the performer. Not me. Exactly. So you're really bringing out, again, some, some great, you know, kind of thoughts and ways of, I'm thinking of it from two hats, okay? So one is the, is the coach's hat, and the, the I, I always go like this, you know, when, when I'm talking, it, it's that, that we're in alignment, okay? Mm -hmm. That our heart and our head and, and what we put out, our inside self and our outside self match, Right. And so when they match, people get you. They may not always like what you have to say, but they get your integrity. They get who you are. And I think what a lot of people struggle with, again, having done this work, you know, for 35 years myself, is the inside self and the outside self don't always match. You know, the, 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 the inside self may, may want something and then the outside self doesn't know how to get it or the, the behavior is kind of different. So part of our job is really like, if this is what you believe and this is what you want and this is, then let's go for it in a way and let's get all these pieces together so that we can, we can move forward. Kind of, I, I think that's what I'm hearing you say. You know, so again, I, I, I'm thinking of a wrench, you know, part of it is like, oh, let's just get it in alignment. Let's get it in balance so that you can be all of who you are and all of, of what you want. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the metaphor of the great bear mother. So the, so, no, the great, no. so the great bear mother, sometimes she, she licks her cubs, you know, and she nurtures them. And, and, and then sometimes she just kicks them out of the, out of the cave, right? But, it, but right. it's all love. It's all love, right? It, it's all that, that sense of this is what is best for you from my perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So how do you deal with people who, uh, who don't want to listen? You know, they, they I hear you, I hear you, I know that. And um, they, they just, you know, they, they don't want to listen. How do you deal with them? Well, first of all, most people who come to me want something anyway. Mm -hmm. So they are, they are more likely to listen. However, one of the things that I have discovered as a coach is I can be more committed to their success Absolutely. than they are. That's it. Could you and repeat? Could you repeat that? That's a that's a very important statement. <laughs> Say it again. That, that the coach can be more committed to the success of the individual they're working with than the individual themselves. Right. And in that moment, you actually have to let them be. You they they have their own lessons to learn in life. I learned a long time ago that it, if some people have karma. And if they're on a path, a particular karmic path, and you interfere with it, they just get mad at you. So the truth of the matter is, is to let them go. They have their own lessons to learn. Mm -hmm. So if someone is really not, and I look at that from a committed place. If, you know, we all know how to lose weight as an example. Right. And people will complain about how they, they can't lose weight or they can't do this or life's not fair or they have a bad metabolism. Right. And, and the truth of the matter is, is, is that they're not, they, I said earlier, life is a game. 
where one thing is more, has to be more important than something else. If what is, so what's, if what's so right now is the most important thing, the game is over. It's over. They will could continue to go on their own path, do their own thing. And so you have to be, you know, again, it's just like any mother, you have to let them go learn their own lessons at their own pace. However, coaches actually take on people that are want to go fast. They want, they actually want to produce bigger results. And the funny thing about accomplishment is it's never experienced until after you're through the eye of the needle. <laughs> you actually don't know you've accomplished something until you have. It's right. When we're in the middle of it, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. And, and um, briefly, uh, I was in the Sonoma County wildfires. Mm -hmm. Yes, and tell us about it, that because that's important it, also. It really, it demanded something of me. First of all, you don't have a lot of opportunity to go, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I. You know, that you don't get to vote on it much. Mm -hmm. it, it puts a big demand on you. And I can go, well, this shouldn't be happening. This isn't right. So I have a mantra that is really, you know, get, how fast can I get off it? How much can I hold? So it's how fast can I get off and how much can I hold? And mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is, as human beings, we can hold a lot. Yeah. But we have to be willing to not say it shouldn't be. And in and, and dealing with the, the wildfire, one of the things that it put a demand on is accomplishing something. In other words, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And the universe lined up beautifully for us. Mm -hmm. The night that we left, um, a family took us in about... 30 miles away, took us in, took our two do our cats, a dog, and us, and, and, and all the belongings that we had, and kept mm -hmm. us for three days. Then we found another place to go with a relative. But in that moment, there were lots of things that the universe aligned around that we couldn't have predicted. Mm -hmm. But we kept moving. Right. We kept engaged in, in surviving the, the wildfire and doing as much as we could. And in, in that process, worked with our, our neighbors, mm -hmm. um, worked with, I had a, a man who was painting my house. I called him. I said, if you want your trailer, you have to get it now. You mm -hmm. have now to get it. So mm -hmm. I didn't, it wasn't just about me. It was about everyone that I was related to. So I didn't just, you know, just look at me in that survival. I looked at others surviving. What can right. I do? So, so I want to interject something here because I think, again, this is really important. When we talk about leadership, one of the things that we know about leaders is they see things that other people may not see. They see options that other people may not see, and they see them very quickly. And they, they, they we, we have a, you know, a word, and you know, do they get it? They get it. You know, they get it very clearly and very, very quickly. And what you're saying, I, I often say, is the key to good mental health is how quickly can we get into reality of what is. You know, what was two seconds before, again, in that fire, what was two seconds before is no more. You know, and so how quickly can you get into the reality of this situation and you get to see the bigger picture, right? So if, if I, I kind of, you know, I teach, a, it's like a toolbox of skills. You know, you're talking about these life skills that you have developed over the years, you know, starting from an early age and your personal characteristics and your aptitudes and, and your parenting and all these pieces have gone together to help you be a very, you know, again, as you're talking and as I'm, I'm thinking of you and I, I kind of think of the, the yoga pose as, you know, the, 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 the mountain pose, you know, strong and, yes. and clear and, you know, your power center is, is, is open and, and clear and strong. And this is what we are moving towards in helping people basically to be able to come to this place of, of, a, of a posture of just getting it quickly. And it doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, as you're talking about in your coaching and certainly from my experience, you know, people don't change overnight. They change, they change over time as we begin to clear the obstacles and clear the challenges and clear those old histories and, and bring people right into the present, right? in terms of how quickly can you see these kinds of things. So I want to bring this back because this is ph phenomenal. Um, you're a beautiful person and I just love hearing your stories. So I want to bring this back into the, the business professional. So do you work with 
individuals and companies or what's the range of people that you coach? I work with individuals. They are entrepreneurs. So I don't, I, well, their personal life may come into the conversation. Mm -hmm. It really is about their business and, and you can't separate them. Who they're being in life is going to get in, you know, as a manager, as a human being is going to get all over their businesses. Right. Um, I do, um, I have my own trainings that I do um, uh, for companies, for, uh, you know, for people to come, entrepreneurs to come together because that lets me get a lot of my tools on them all at one time mm -hmm. so they can go faster. So people can really take advantage of that and go faster by working in the workshops as well as on their individual coaching. And then I do what I would consider corporate trainings. My corporate trainings are designed just for that company. Mm -hmm. what it is that they're working on. It could be performance and productivity. It could be the leadership. It could be management. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different things that have been done um, for them at building teams, etc. So I work in those three areas, one individual coaching workshops and also in corporate training. So yeah. I, I bring that in as well. Okay. Because we have a range of people that are listening that are going to be listening to this interview from the, the, the entrepreneur, the one, the solopreneur who may be just getting started or maybe just a couple years in, you know, up to the corporate multi-million dollar company. So I, if you're talking to the, the solopreneur, again, I've been on my own for the last 35 years and started over a number of times. So I know a lot of the issues that we solopreneurs deal with. And what, again, what I started saying before is how would you talk to a person who is just getting started or just sort of early on and wanting to do it right? Because so many of us have spent thousands and thousands of dollars and not gotten the results that we wanted. So what would you, how would you rec talk to that person? It's just that. Well, there's, there's probably a lot of different facets to that question. But as an, as an individual, one of the things that constrains them is they're afraid of getting too much business and they can't handle it. Mm -hmm. There's, that could happen. There's mm -hmm. another where people have a real breakdown in keeping their word, keeping their agreements, keeping their promises. They may not have the infrastructure to do it. Mm -hmm. They may not read their emails. There, there's a lot of different things that can come into play with that. But I would say fundamentally, they need to make a plan and work the plan. They need to actually see, this is, what, this is what my business plan is. This is how I'm going to grow it. How am I going to do customer service? What is it that I'm going to do? But in every case, they must keep their agreements. Mm -hmm. And people tend to not do that. They're, we're all slippery. Mm -hmm. We're all slippery. Right. However, they need to keep their agreements, return their phone calls. And, and the truth of it, I don't have a lot of energy about what people do or don't do in that sense. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to say, I'm going to return the call, then return the call. If you say, I have an appointment, be there and be on time. And do things happen? You bet. I, I don't, you know, it, but clean it up. If it's something happens, clean it up and, and don't let it happen again. But that's the piece with the individuals that are growing their business. Mm -hmm. They need to know what their business is. They need to be um, authentic and keep their agreements. And if they can't keep their agreements, they need to communicate it right away. Beautiful. And what do you talk, how do you talk to the, the person who's undercapitalized as a, as a beginning entrepreneur? Because again, this is something I hear all the time. You know, we know that we need to help. We know that we need a support system and yet I can't afford it. What, very good question, actually. So, one of the things in looking at it, we have a lot of technology today that mm -hmm. lets us not have to have a lot of capitalization in you know, a virtual assistance. Those we, we, there's VAs, virtual assistants that you can use that are very uh, cost effective. Mm -hmm. My the thing that I find that happens with most entrepreneurs is they don't know how to manage. They don't know how to manage their time. They don't know how to manage their infrastructure. They don't know how to manage their finances. If they can get those, uh, you know, actually get those tools in place, whether it's using QuickBooks or, I mean, I've had cal people use their calendar for statistics. I mean, th there, it doesn't have to be complex. Right. But the other thing, the other thing that I see is, is most people are visual. Mm -hmm. they, 
Oh, I'm a big fan of whiteboards as an example. Mm -hmm. Dashboards, you know, anything that can get the 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 statistics, what they're up to in front of them, really confront them. And I can tell you that was real interesting in a, a group training that I did. Um, uh, I work with a large restaurant group in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I have, I have the privilege every year of working with their staff, up to 140 of their staff. Mm -hmm. And I've actually worked with all 200 of them at one time. Mm -hmm. But that said, they, they're young. They're, they're um, 28 to 38, most of them. And we started talking about keeping their agreements and how they could do it was by using a calendar. You know, if I promise to go to the dentist, I put it on an appointment on my calendar, right? If I promise to go have lunch with you, I put it on my calendar. And if I promise to do X, Y, Z, for me personally, it's on my calendar. Exactly. If it's not on my calendar, the chance, the likelihood of it being done. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. It was like a new, like a novelty. A calendar? Really? Wow. So there's a calendar on your phone. Really? Wow. Okay. So it was real interesting to see the tool that they had, they didn't know how to use. Hmm. So I think that that really it's about tapping into that part. And if they're undercapitalized, there's things that they can do. But most people are ostriches when it comes to money. Mm -hmm. They put their head in the sand, and, but their butt's still in the air. So the thing is, is they have to be willing to confront it. And even the successful entrepreneurs will not look at their profit and loss statements, their financial statements. For, and I've discovered for one of two reasons. One is it's really good and they're afraid it's going to disappear. Right. Or it's really bad and they don't want to know. Hmm. Either way, they're not using their financial statement, which is a management tool. Right. They don't use it. And part of my career has been about providing that management tool not what the accountants want per se right. i want it to be a management tool because it tells a story about how effective their management is because if i say i'm managing sales and i'm taking my sales from two hundred thousand dollars a month to five hundred thousand dollars a month as an example or it could be mm -hmm. twenty thousand to fifty thousand it doesn't really matter what the, right. the where the right. zero is on that i need to know that i took the action that's going to produce that result Right. And that I, in fact, am measuring for that. So you get what you measure for. So I'm measuring for that. And then I look at my financial report to see how did I do? How did I do on that? Did I do what I said I was going to do? Right. Right. And if I didn't do that, what actions do I need to take? What actions do I need to take to right. actually cause that result? By the way, causing something is a leadership skill. Right. And, and, you know, and again, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, just on the personal level about the unconscious is unconscious, but it's the same thing in your business. If you're not seeing things because either you're not trained to see it or you just you have your own blind spots. That's the killer, isn't it? You know, of, of just which is why it's so helpful to have a coach. It's so helpful to have a mentor, somebody who can sort of you know, keep you straight, get you straight, get you started, you know, keep you moving and, and help you kind of look at the things that you're just not seeing, you know, even with the best of intentions. Uh, you, this is, something you just said is really, really a critical element. It's about clarity. Mm -hmm. It's about clarity. And when we get into something and we have stuff being we're confronted by something or there's a lot, we're overwhelmed, we're experiencing being overwhelmed we lose our clarity right. we lose our vision right and so part of what a coach does is helps keep people clear and give them action steps so that they can you know put one foot in front of the other because really is the breakthroughs are incremental yes the breakthroughs they are. occur, but the, the actions tend to be incremental yeah and you know you, you picked up the word clarity which for me is probably the most important word in my life Mm -hmm. um, because when I can't see it clearly, um, I, I just know that I'm in trouble. Really, you know, yes. it, it's being able to see the path or am I making the right decisions or, you know, I'll frequently call my brother sometimes even, and say, what am I missing? What am I missing? You know, um, mm -hmm. yes. and so living with that level, it's a different kind of uncertainty 
there's uncertainty that we have to learn to live with because we're taking risks and there are no guarantees. So that's a level of the unknown uncertainty that we're living in that, that again, if you're not willing to do that, you can't be an entrepreneur in my, in my book. Right. But that's a different kind of clarity. Like, are my decisions good decisions? Am I making the right things? Are these good choices for me? Cause I can't see the whole picture sometimes, you know? And so I'm a big picture person. And when I, when I can't see the whole, you know, I can't see the picture uh, and I feel um, blinded or, and, 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 you know, it kind of brings to mind for me, kind of when I started doing this work, I couldn't believe how long people could live in that level of unclear, unclarity, whatever the word is, you know, for years and years and years. It's like, wow, I'm so uncomfortable. I want to, you know, why wouldn't you want to know what's in front of you? So I'm just kind of bringing that in because it's just bringing to mind of there's a lot of people who are willing to live in that really dark place. And what you're saying and what I'm saying and, and, and good coaching and good help is you don't have to do that. You know, the help is available. The help, the help is here. People who have been where, you know, you haven't traveled yet. They, 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 they know the story. They know the picture. And they can see things that you can't see. So, you mm-hmm. know, I, I think that's kind of what you're saying. Um, Loretta, I have so enjoyed this. I, we could keep going. <laughs> we could, couldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> you know, between your experience and mine and, and, and sort of the, the, the meeting of these two places, uh, is, is fantastic. And so I want to know, and I want people to know how they can get in touch with you because I think that you're an absolute treasure to know. So, so let us know, how can we get in touch with you? Well, the, the simplest thing to do is to, um, call me. So it's 707-539-7481. Okay. Let's want to repeat 707. it again? Repeat it again. Yes. Yeah, 707 five three nine seven four eight one and the good thing about that is you don't need to know where i am it will it'll track me down it it will it rolls to my cell phone when i have taken calls in mexico australia and germany so i'm laughing for a second because you and i are old-fashioned i actually pick up the phone (laughs) yes well i'm a real-time person i like to get things done in real time i don't like to come home to 10 messages and 200 emails. The other thing is you can email me. And my email is Loretta, and it's spelled L-A-U-R-E-T-T-A at Power Source Consulting. So that's P-O-W-E-R-S-O-U-R-C-E consulting.com. So, and if you Google my name, Loretta Hayes, you'll also find me. Okay. So there's and, lots of ways to get a hold of me and, and, or they can contact you. There you go. <laughs> there we go. And I will be sure to post it. And I want to thank you once again. And this is just the beginning, hopefully, of a great relationship. Thank you again. I'm Loretta. looking forward to it. Thanks it was a so delight much. for sure. Thank you. Thank you.